Hello, everyone. My name is Taya Miles, and I am a Radcliffe alumni professor and also a faculty member in the history department here at Harvard. And I would like to welcome you to the Kim and Judy Davis Dean's Lecture in the Social Sciences. I am honored to serve as the moderator for our program today. We'll try that. We'll see if that makes a difference. Before I introduce our speakers, let me take a moment to thank Kim and Judy Davis, whose support makes this lecture series possible. We are very fortunate to have Kim Davis with us in the audience. Thank you so much, Kim, for being here. We are also grateful, thank you, Jessica. We are also grateful to the members of the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all of our annual donors. Radcliffe programming is free and open to the public because of your generosity, and we thank you very much. Audience members, here in the room and also in the Zoom space, we welcome you to submit your questions at any time during the session. And you can do that by using the Slido link which should be behind me on the screen, there it is. And it's also in the Zoom space in the chat function. We will get to as many of your questions as we can. So I am greatly honored to moderate this event and to introduce our speakers. Two women who have contributed significant service, wisdom, and writing to higher education. Investing their time and care and the betterment of other people, scholars, researchers, students, and community members alike. We have in them models for how to lead institutions and advance the pursuit of knowledge in challenging times. And now I hope you'll get comfortable because these introductions are going to be a little bit lengthy. Uh, our, our conversation partners are quite, quite accomplished. Tamiko Brown Nagan is Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, which is an international leading center for research across the humanities, sciences, social sciences, arts, and professions. And Radcliffe is especially known for the way in which it fosters interdisciplinary research. Dean Brown Nagan is also the Daniel P. S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and a Professor of History in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She is an award-winning legal historian and an expert in constitutional law and education, law, and policy. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and the American Philosophical Society a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and a member of the editorial board of the, of the excuse me, American Journal of Constitutional History and the board of directors of ProPublica. Dean Brown Nagin has published on a wide range of topics, including the Supreme Court, civil rights law and history, the Affordable Care Act, and education reform. Her scholarship and commentary have been published in the Yale Law Review, the Duke Law Journal, Law and History Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Washington Post, and Politico Magazine, among other publications. Her latest book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, explores the life and times of the path-breaking lawyer, politician, and judge. Civil Rights Queen is an absorbing profile of a life and an extended period of momentous social change in this country. In it, Dean Brown Nagin probes the efficacy of competing strategies for progress in a way that is instructive for our very difficult political moment. Cited as a best book of 2022 by The New Yorker, The LA Times, Smithsonian, and Time Magazine, Civil Rights Queen won the Darlene Clark Hine Award, and the Leon Smith Book Award for 2023. And it's been optioned for a documentary film, which we all cannot wait to see. Dean Brown Nagin's previous book, Courage to Dissent, 
Atlanta and the long history of the civil rights movement, won a 2012 Bancroft Prize in American History, which is among the highest honors in the historical profession. It also won many other historical and legal prizes. From 2019 to 2022, Dean Brown Nagin chaired the Presidential Commission on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, initiated by President Bacow. As chair, she led the university-wide initiative and co-authored the committee's landmark report detailing the university's direct financial and intellectual ties to slavery. That effort resulted in Harvard's unprecedented commitment of $100 million to redress harms to descendant communities in the US and the Caribbean. Harvard University Press published the report to wide acclaim in 2022. And our special honored guest today is President Emerita Ruth J. Simmons. Ruth J. Simmons is a distinguished presidential fellow at Rice University, an advisor to the president of Harvard University on HBCU initiatives. She served as president of Prairie View A&M until March 2023. Prior to joining Prairie View, she was president of Brown University from 2001 to 2012 and president of Smith College from 1995 to 2001. Under her leadership, Prairie View was reclassified as an R2 research institute and Brown made significant strides in improving its standing as one of the world's finest research universities. A French professor before entering university administration, President Simmons held an appointment as a professor of comparative literature and Africana studies at Brown. After completing her PhD in Romance Languages and Literatures here at Harvard, she served in various faculty and administrative roles at the University of Southern California, Princeton University, and Spelman College before becoming president of Smith College, which is the largest women's college in the US. At Smith, she launched numerous major academic initiatives, including an engineering program, the first of its kind at an American women's college. Ruth Simmons has received many honors, including a Fulbright Fellowship to France, the 2001 President's Award from the United Negro College Fund, the 2002 Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Medal, the 2004 Eleanor Roosevelt Val Kill Medal, the Foreign Policy Association Medal, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and Centennial Medal, uh, let me back up and say that more clearly, and the Centennial Medal from Harvard University. She has received over 40 honorary degrees from universities around the world, including Oxford, AWOC Women's University in South Korea, and the American College in Greece. Dr. Simmons is a member of the National, National Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Council on Foreign Relations. And she serves on the boards of the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, the Alley Theater, the MacArthur Foundation, Morehouse College, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Holdsworth Center, and Heinz Global Income Trust. She received the Brown Faculty's highest honor, the Susan Culver Rosenberger Medal in 2011, and she was honored by the Prairie View faculty in 2022. In 2012, she was named a Chevalier, is that close perhaps, such Simmons? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, of the French Legion of Honor. Her new memoir, Up Home, is a stirring narrative about her childhood growing up in East Texas. The family members, community members, and especially the teachers who shaped her. And the winding road she traveled from cotton fields and small classrooms to becoming one of this nation's greatest educators. Ruth Simmons says at the start of Up Home, that she hopes the book will, quote, help young people understand that whatever the circumstance of their lives, they are born not to be the person that history, limited resources, and others dictate, but rather to be the person that they are willing to pour their heart and soul into becoming. It is now my great pleasure to invite Tamika brown Nagin and Ruth Simmons to the stage.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. And I am just thrilled to have the opportunity to be in conversation with the great Dr. Ruth Simmons about her wonderful memoir. And I have my copy here. It's a little worn already. The dust cover's torn because I've been carrying it around for weeks um, and being inspired by it. And I will say that not only was I inspired, the book really touched my heart. Hmm. And I read a lot of books. <laughs> and I can't recall saying that any book touched my heart. And so the first thing I want to say to you on behalf of all of us, I'm sure there are many in the audience who were similarly inspired and touched, thank you. Thank you for writing this book for us. And perhaps I can start the conversation by asking you why you wrote the memoir and whom did you seek, whom did you see as your audience and what did you hope they'd take away from the book? Thank you and thank you for having me here. And I just say, I wanna say how delighted I am that um, Adele and Larry Eka are here. Uh, so wonderful to see um, old friends. Um, over the years, in a life that was often puzzling to me, um, meaning my life, um, <laughs> uh, I struggled to explain to students, or rather to answer their questions, because it was always, how on earth did you do X, Y, and Z? And over time, I grew more and more perturbed <laughs> about the way that my students were thinking about my life because I did not want to be seen as someone who had done anything so miraculous. Um, I wanted them to understand how simple it was to me to build the life that I had. Um, I of often recall when I was at Smith, um, I was driving along uh, a road on campus and a Smith student was limping along with, on crutches. And it was, it, was, uh, it was on an incline. Mm. So of course I stopped my car and said, get in, I'll take you to wherever you need to go. And she said, to my dismay, oh no, President Simmons, if you could do what you've done, I can certainly get up this hill on crutches. Mm. Well, I didn't want students feeling that way. Mm. Um, and so, uh, so, although I tried to answer how I went from A to B to C uh, in my life, um, I found it still that I keep getting the questions. And so I thought I'd save myself the trouble and just tell people once and for all how it happened. <laughs> um, and maybe the questions would go, would go away. Um, I didn't imagine as I started to uh, write it, how difficult it would be to talk about the circumstances of my youth um, and particularly things like the death of my mother mm. uh, and the impact that that had on me and so on. Uh, and so there were moments when it was a true struggle to relive those moments. But I always felt that it would be worth it if, this, if my students could understand, again, how a life evolves. Mm -hmm. Because their notion of, um, they're, they're very formulaic often in the way they think about things. Okay, so, okay, now Ruth, you did this and then that. So what, how, do I do, how do I go about imitating your path? Right. Um, and of course, we know it's not about that at all. Um, and so I wanted to emphasize the importance of learning, of being open-minded, about caring about other people, about being um, embracing fully uh, the opportunity to, to learn mm -hmm. um, and so forth, uh, and also to care about um, the rights of other people. 
Um, and uh, if I could do that, and if I could instill that in the students who have come to me, I, I thought it would be well worth writing the book. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, again, thank you for doing so. Um, it sounds like it's a way of mentoring students. Yes. Um, yes, close and afar. Well, let's talk about the home in, a, in Up Home. And I want to read a passage um, from the book. You write that you were born at a crossroads, a crossroads in history, a crossroads in culture, and that over the course of your life, you were constantly trying to return to the place of my childhood. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your home, your family, community, and how they all shaped your personal journey. Well, um, of course, the, um, uh, the rural Texas in the late 40s and, and 50s uh, was a very particular thing. Um, it, <laughs> oh, okay. So, so, <laughs> I guess you get that. Um, if you were black and lived in rural Texas, uh, East Texas, where I come from, um, you, there's certain, um, there was a certainty to your life. Mm. Um, you were going to toil um, in fields. Um, you were not going to be educated. Um, and you were not going to have any rights whatsoever. Um, and it's very hard for young people today to imagine a world in which uh, if you went into town, um, you had to step off the sidewalk so that whites could pass. It's hard for them to imagine the ways in which um, we accepted not being able to go in the front door um, of mm -hmm. an establishment. Um, uh, or to go into, uh, or to drink from certain fountains, um, or to do in, have any of the amenities that people have become accustomed to. It's very hard to imagine that, but that's the way, that's the way it was. And thankfully, our parents understood that we lived at a dangerous time, and that if we were in town and we showed any, any uh, arrogance, they called it uppity, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at that moment that we could be summarily disciplined um, by any white person. Uh, because it turns out that every white uh, person had certain rights over us. Um, so that's, that's the environment uh, generally that we were in. Day-to-day uh, -day life uh, was basically spent in the, in the fields working. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing about that is that everybody went to work in the fields. So it didn't matter if you were a child. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as you could do that physical labor, you were in the fields. But of course, what that meant is that we were all together. So my parents were there, all of my sisters and brothers were there, and I was too young. Uh, to do any, uh, any labors, serious labor. And so they dragged me along on cotton sacks, mm -hmm. um, but we were all together. Mm -hmm. So we were together at home, we were together in the fields, uh, we were together all the time. And so as you might imagine, in that kind of environment, which was isolated, um, we were a very close family. Mm -hmm. And that marked my childhood, and it's marked my entire life, to be mm -hmm. perfectly honest with you. Um, I met with a group of students today, uh, and they wanted to know, looking at my life, what impelled me to be able to do things that were unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did, I, how did I stand up to people um, who were... Um, uh, who were criticizing me or who were saying that I was making a serious mistake. Mm -hmm. And I found it a little odd when they asked me that because I've never, ever, ever had any doubts really about who I was and whether or not uh, there was a ballast back there because of my family. Mm -hmm. uh, and my mother um, taught me so much. She had an eighth grade education. But she would always um, 
uh, teach us as she was doing her chores. And uh, my favorite scene that I recall is, you know, sitting on the porch. Um, our houses were basically four rooms. Um, it was a bedroom for the girls, a bedroom for the boys. My parents slept in the front room, mm -hmm. and then there was a kitchen. Uh, and so there was no room in the house to do any work. And so usually the porch provided that extension. And so my mother would sit on the porch, and she would do whatever she needed to do. She'd do, she'd do ironing. Uh, she'd do food prep. Mm -hmm. And so she'd be sitting and shelling peas. Um, how many of you have ever shelled peas? Oh, come on, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> you have not shelled peas. I don't mean bird's eye that you buy in the frozen aisle. But as she is, and that was one of the, you know, one of the chores that was arduous. Right. So she'd be shelling peas, but as she's shelling peas or preparing corn, she's also talking to us about life. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, um, your family is very important. Don't ever, ever separate from your family. Mm. Uh, she'd say, um, never think you're better than another human being. Um, or, um, you know, she was very generous uh, in, and very giving. Um, we were desperately poor, of course, and, and we remember our childhood as, be, we were really hungry all the time. There was never enough food for, for all of us. And my mother would do the darndest things. People would come to visit us, and she'd offer them our food. Mm. And we were mortified by this. Um, but that's the way she was. She mm -hmm. thought that, you know, uh, that she had to share whatever we had, she had to share. Mm -hmm. But the darndest thing is that whenever we'd go to somebody else's house, she would not permit us to oh, have anything <laughs> uh, from their house because they might need it more. Uh -huh. um, it was really, <laughs> really um, uh, very uh, uh, puzzling to me at the time. Uh, but um, she had certain values that uh, she taught us um, uh, to live by, um, and uh, that helped me enormously as I grew up and as I made my way through my career because nothing has ever been as important to me as the values that I was taught. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've held on to them uh, more than I've held on to anything else, uh, mm -hmm. really, in my life. Mm -hmm. Because um, it rooted me, and it gave me the ability to stand up to pressure mm -hmm. and to do the things that I thought were right, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the things that people wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And let me ask a follow-up. You write so beautifully about your closeness to your family, and yet, of course, your life was one of exploration, of traveling uh, far away from home. Yeah. And there is a, it's very poignant the way you describe the sense of um, almost mental distress of wanting to go and explore while at the same time wanting to remain close to your family. And right. I imagine that there are many students yeah. who have a similar kind of um, distress mm -hmm. at becoming who they are right. here at Harvard or other institutions yeah. and staying in touch with home. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, <clears throat> I began to understand at a fairly young age that um, the life I was living uh, was, was a lie. Uh, I did not believe that it was true that blacks were unworthy of equality. I did not believe it was true that my mind was inferior. Mm -hmm. I did not believe it was true that I had to be consigned to a life uh, separated from every other uh, human type on the face of the earth. Um, and, uh, and so that, the fact that I knew that was a lie meant that I needed to find places um, that represented um, a, a better reality from what I knew as a child. Um, and so uh, I began to explore different worlds through reading initially. 
uh, imagining what life might be like um, without all of the racism mm -hmm. and discrimination that we faced. Um, and then uh, as soon as I could, um, I left the country to see what was elsewhere. And so I think when I was 17, um, my Spanish teacher said, you know, you might go to Mexico uh, mm -hmm. to, um, to accelerate your language learning in uh, Spanish. And so I got on a Greyhound bus, didn't tell my family where I was going, because <laughs> um, they would have been, right. again, um, <laughs> very upset um, uh, about it, nor did they understand the journey I was on. Mm -hmm. uh, none of them left home, none. Mm. Um, and so, um, so I went off to Mexico to live with a Mexican family and uh, study Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I really continued that uh, and studied, uh, I studied French and then went off to France. And, mm -hmm. and my goal was to see the world and understand something about why we do the things we do to each other as human beings. Mm -hmm. I, I was on a quest to be, uh, to understand the history of my family and why we'd been treated the way we were. Uh, but most of all, I never wanted to repeat the errors that I saw um, as a child. I didn't want to be a racist myself. I didn't mm -hmm. want to, um, to think um, uh, uh, that other people who were different from me because they looked different, because they um, came from, uh, they had a different religion. Um, mm -hmm were less than, than me. So I was preparing myself to be a full human being, even though I couldn't have expressed it that way as a 17-year-old, but that's actually what I was doing. Right. Um, and, uh, and of course, it was all important to me. But at the same time, I couldn't talk to my family about it mm -hmm. because um, first I knew that they would not understand and they would discourage me. Mm -hmm. uh, from doing that. Um, they thought I was just weird. <laughs> and, and I am a little bit, but um, not as much as they think. Anyway. Um, so, so this whole idea um, of wanderlust was, uh, was something that they didn't understand. But here's the most important thing. The class issue was the hardest. Mm -hmm. Because how do you say to your family living at the poverty line, toiling every day in factories, that you're having high tea um, at, on a college campus. Right. How do you say that to them in a way that they can understand? Um, how do you say to your family when they cannot even afford to go to the next town for a holiday that you're off in France bicycling uh, in southern France, mm -hmm. um, you can't. Um, and so I hid most of what I was doing, uh, and I felt bad about it uh, in some ways because I knew how privileged I was. Right. Um, and I never thought I was better than my family, mm -hmm. ever. Um, I just knew it was something that I needed to do and that they wouldn't understand. But I also had a conviction that over time, what I was doing was ultimately going to benefit them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that has come to fruition is yeah. exciting for me mm -hmm. uh, because, um, because uh, I've been able to make their lives better. Right. Um, and uh, and I, probably nothing gives me more joy than the fact that finally I've been able to demonstrate to them that the learning mm -hmm. that I was involved in as a, as a young child uh, really redounded to everybody's benefit, mm -hmm. not just mine. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, you talk about the wanderlust and the travel, but I want to go back for a bit um, to discuss the remembrances in your memoir of particular schools or teachers from Ms. Ida Mae Henderson's classroom when you were six years old through your graduation from Dillard and then your acceptance at Harvard. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the lessons that those teachers, those institutions imparted and how they influenced you over time. 
Well, uh, imagine now if you're on, uh, if you are on a sharecropper's farm, um, living in crowded conditions and being in fields, um, uh, you you don't think of yourself as having any importance. Mm. It was actually not until I went to school that I began to feel that I mattered somehow. Um, you know, teachers are wonderful, uh, but they also lie to us. And that's a wonderful thing that they do. Mm. And so my first teacher, when I walked into that first classroom, um, now keep in mind, I'm wearing um, clothes made from uh, discarded flower sacks, um, barely shod, uh, my hair all over my head. I'm the ultimate country bumpkin. And this teacher says to me, good morning, baby. How are you? I'm so happy to see you. Mm. Um, here's your desk and um, your books and you know, your, your, your writing utensils and so forth. I think you're just going to do wonderfully here. First of all, she's talking, at her, ta her speech is just magical mm. because I'm used to um, the way that farmers talk, mm -hmm. um, mumbling, and you can barely understand you know, what's coming out of their mouths, and here's this woman who is speaking clearly mm. and, um, and with an intonation that suggests that there's something marvelous and wonderful happening, and so, and so I'm thinking, what is this? <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 transformational, is what right. it is, and so um, and so this woman, Miss Ida May, encouraged me, uh, and everything that I did, you know, was oh, a marvel, mm -hmm. which of course was not true, but nevertheless, um, she heaped praise on me, and and now. What I concluded from this first experience is that education must be something extraordinary, and I wanted to be a part of it forever because mm -hmm. of that experience, mm -hmm. which is why I say to everybody who teaches, you know, be very careful uh, when you walk out in front of young people, mm -hmm. um, or anybody else for that matter, because you cannot have a down day. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't afford, because you don't know what influence you're going to have on somebody um, that, uh, that very day. And so you must be hopeful, uh, ever hopeful, uh, mm -hmm. because they steal that from you. I lived in a time when I could not be hopeful. There was no reason to be. Mm -hmm. My life was going, to, I was gonna become a maid, um, and my life was going to be uh, very um, ordinary, perhaps, um, and I couldn't hope for anything better than that. How would I have? And yet teachers hoped for a different future, mm -hmm. and I got that hope from them. Mm. So um, be hopeful always um, uh, when you're talking to uh, young people mm -hmm. because they may, they may need it because they may not be able to envision that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about a, a really striking sentence in your book on page 195. You write, rejected by Yale, I was admitted to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> and this is for graduate school. Yeah. I wonder why you include that anecdote. You, you go on to talk about how it shook your confidence. Um, why did you include that, and what did you hope people would take from it? Well, I, students, um, you know, for, uh, so many students, um, just imagine a, 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 um, a perfect upward trajectory hmm. with every success possible. Uh, that's the way they imagine their path uh, forward. And I wanted always for people to know that that certainly is not has not been my life. Mm -hmm. I've had disappointments, and as I say, um, most of the time those disappointment disappointments led to something fantastic for me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so, uh, I mean, I had the, I have my favorite um, 
my favorite ones. That 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 one, um, Yale was one. Right. I mean, how how dare they? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. now, and I, I remind them of that, of course. Yes, of yeah. course you do. Um, and, um, and then um, I was once a candidate, somewhat reluctantly, for the presidency of Oberlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through the process, and then they didn't select me. Hmm. And I decided, well, you know, that's fine, because I don't like this presidential stuff anyway. Mm. Uh, and I'm never going to uh, aspire to be a president. And so I settled back into what I was doing. And within months, Smith came and asked me to be president. Mm. And then I thought about it. Oh, my God. I could have become president of Oberlin in Ohio. <laughs> uh, uh, and that didn't happen. Thank God it didn't happen, because I became president of Smith. Right. Um, you know, and that's the way life is. I mean, you, you, you think that. Um, something has happened to you so horrible, mm. so horrible, mm. uh, and then you you um, you are in a a cul-de-sac, mm -hmm. and then suddenly something else arises mm -hmm. that you never would have done right. had it not been for the path um, having been closed to you. That happened repeatedly uh, mm -hmm. to me, and mostly for my because of my own errors. Uh, you know, I was very um, difficult as a child. Uh, I was difficult as a teenager. Mm. I was difficult as a young adult um, because I always forcefully expressed my opinion mm. uh, to people who were not interested in it. <laughs> and um, as a consequence of that, um, a lot of doors closed mm. um, uh, for me. Um, early on, um, and uh, I and yet I was rescued somehow. So my first year at Dillard, um, I got there, and oh my goodness, uh, it's a it's it's a, a religiously affiliated college, mm -hmm. and I discovered that they had a chapel requirement, right. a chapel requirement. <laughs> I had to go to chapel and listen to a sermon. Well, I I said. This is not appropriate. Mm. Um, and, I, and I said, it makes no sense for a college to have a required chapel requirement. Mm. Because what about Muslims and Jews and Catholics? Uh, would they have to go to Protestant service? And so I said, well, I'm not doing it. I'm simply not going to honor your requirement. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to believe, I know. But, but um, and they, um, when I was a senior, they wrote home to inform my family that I could not graduate mm -hmm. because I had not satisfied the chapel requirement right. in my senior year, yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, my family was very, they were shocked by right. this because yeah. they didn't know about my shenanigans, you know. Um, but still, I mean, I, I was fiercely um, advocating my opinion mm -hmm. about, uh, about how unjust it was to force that on people. And so um, I managed, though, in my, in my spring semester, after they wrote to my family, uh, news came that Harvard had admitted me. Um, and that Fulbright was awarding me a Fulbright. Mm -hmm. And the college couldn't figure what to do because they couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't announce that right. unless I graduated. Right. And so they allowed me to graduate without <laughs> satisfying the requirement. And, right. <laughs> but but here's, the, here's the sweetest thing of all to me. Last week, I went to Dillard to do um, a book talk. Mm -hmm. um, and when I arrived, they, they've always been nervous about me because of, <laughs> because of my mouth, you know. Um, and uh, when I arrived, um, uh, the chaplain um, met me and said, I want you to know that we did not um, uh, stage this in the chapel. We're doing it in the auditorium instead. They still think, you know, that back to the time. Um, but but here's the thing um, that 
uh, it's so important to impress on people uh, uh, that they stick to their values mm -hmm. because, um, because they disapproved, uh, of course, of what I was doing. Uh, but today, of course, I get lauded because I'm so wonderful today because I've right. you know, um, represented the university well. Um, these kinds of hypocritical things take place all the time, mm -hmm. but we don't have to be subservient to them. Mm -hmm. uh, we can be who we fully are. And I believe that as a 17 year old, I believed at every moment of my journey. Um, and it's okay with me when people punish me for being outspoken, but they will live to regret it if they oh, do. Wow, very good. <laughs> so let's talk about gender. Your memoir grapples with limited conceptions of women and women's roles you grew up with. And yet, of course, you became the president of Smith and you're a path-breaking woman educator. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the foundational experiences that allowed you to appreciate that you too could lead. Well, I, um, I grew up in the most patriarchal environment imaginable. Mm. Um, my father was a tyrant. Mm. Uh, he dictated everything uh, in the household. My mother was completely subservient um, to him. And, um, and by extension, all of my brothers, all seven of my brothers were the princes. Right. And so uh, all of the girls were uh, secondary. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no rights, basically. Um, they were taken care of first. And including, if some of you have been in the South, you may remember um, this, uh, men had to be served first. And so um, uh, women mm -hmm. ate afterwards right. um, uh, and so forth. So that was the, that was the environment. Um, but I had two very strong older sisters who fought against that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were tremendous models for me um, that um, I didn't have to accept um, the um, leavings uh, uh, all the time mm -hmm. and that I didn't have to uh, stand back and not have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, but um, ultimately, I would say it was not until, and by the way, in, in black culture, um, coming through the civil rights moment, as well as afterwards, black women were expected to stand back and let black men lead. Right. And so it was always uh, considered very bad form mm -hmm. if, as a girl, you were smarter and you showed that because you were supposed to let the black uh, boy be smarter and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, unbelievable. But it was not until I got into to Wellesley mm -hmm. during my junior year um, mm -hmm. and saw Margaret clap. Mm. that I understood what was possible. Mm -hmm. Because I think she was the first very powerful woman that I had ever seen in person. But to know that she uh, was running that institution as president mm -hmm. uh, meant everything to me. I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, and so I think girls, um, are in a much stronger, obviously, much different position mm -hmm. um, today. Uh, but there are, there are environments in which women still don't, cannot quite believe that they have the right to be a full equal. Um, and uh, so we still have work to do in making sure that that is clear. Mm, thank you. Now, let's talk a bit about uh, your one-of-kind leadership in higher education. You were the president of Smith, the women's college. Um, you were president of Brown, the first black president in the Ivy League. And then you were president of Prairie View A&M, which is an historically black college, which is just a tremendous career, singular. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the accomplishments at those institutions that you're proudest of? 
Ooh, that's a little awkward. A few, um, a few. Okay. Um, in terms of a strand, mm -hmm. I, I would say the proudest accomplishment that I had in all three institutions is that my students love me. Aww. Aww. Um, they were so generous to me in every regard. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to, to me, it was always about um, leading young people to a place where they could maximize their talents and their intelligence mm -hmm. and aspire to be whole human beings um, that will add something to the world. And I wanted to model that in the way that teachers had modeled it for me. Mm -hmm. So I cared an awful lot about what I did, about how I appeared uh, to my students. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, in terms of making difficult decisions, uh, in terms of explaining who I was, in terms of um, uh, asking them for their help um, and establishing relationships with the students, um, that's probably the thing that I am proudest of mm -hmm. uh, because um, you know how your students come back years later and they want you to meet their children? Mm -hmm. um, that's the greatest compliment, <laughs> uh, really, uh, if it mm -hmm. weren't for the age, uh, you know, the obvious problem with making you feel old. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the, but, uh, but aside from that, um, uh, I have been on this journey in higher education for a long time, and naturally, I've been on it during a time when higher education has been undergoing needed change. Mm -hmm. When I came into the profession, there were very few uh, African-American faculty, um, and one of my tasks was to try to address that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so some of the work that I did before I became president was much more important than what I did as president. And so um, at Princeton, for example, at a time when uh, women uh, on the faculty um, uh, were um, very, uh, mod there was a very modest number of women on the faculty, particularly in uh, engineering and sciences. Um, and um, when there were very few African-American faculty, um, that's a problem that I tackled. Mm -hmm. um, and I tackled it by being um, <laughs> disagreeable. Um, and, um, and that's why I never thought I would go anywhere in my career because I, I, was, I, I was such a nag. Um, so I do straight things like, um, I remember once at Princeton, I, uh, I, I thought, I've got something that has to be done about this problem. So I decided I'd do a white paper. Mm. Well, nobody asked me to do a white paper. Mm. But I, I, I stayed at uh, my office late at night, and I finished this white paper. And of course, I marched it down the next morning to the president's office uh, and to the provost, who happened to be Neil Rudenstein at the time, mm. and uh, said, here, I, I want you to read this because um, it's very important that we do something about this problem. And I left it with them. And naturally, I thought, oh, thank goodness, I've done that, and my job <laughs> is over. So Neil called me um, uh, the next day or so uh, to his office. So I thought, okay, this is it, I'm gonna be fired. Um, but he said, uh, okay, we've read your paper, and, and we agree with you. Hmm. I said, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, and he said, then, now go do it. And so the paper that I had written made the case for a huge investment in hiring uh, women. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, if we needed a new chemistry building, we wouldn't hesitate to put hundreds of millions of dollars into it. Mm -hmm. And yet our more serious problem right now is that we have all these women students and we don't have women faculty. 
And if we took that same amount of money that we would put into a chemistry building and we spent it to attract faculty, imagine how Princeton would be changed. Mm -hmm. That was my argument. Mm -hmm. And so they gave me the ability that moment to hire as many faculty as I could find departments willing to hire. Wow. Math at the time had no women at all. They didn't sort of believe in, in women in math. Um, <laughs> There were no women's restrooms in the math building. Oh, my goodness. Well, why, why have a woman's restroom? <laughs> um, and uh, the math department said there were no women who were fit to be appointed to the faculty in, in math. Mm -hmm. So I had a conversation with the chairman of math, and I said, OK, well, I, I certainly understand that. And you, you don't want to appoint anybody who's unqualified. However, if you can find women uh, to a point to the faculty in math, no matter how many it is, I'll give you the money to do it, and you don't have to use one of your faculty lines. Mm -hmm. That year, they asked for six faculty lines. Mm. Okay? So one of the things that we have to do is puncture people's lame excuses mm. for not doing the right thing. Right. And right. one of the ways of doing that was to say, okay, I'm going to test this. So if I give you the resources, let's see what you can do. And that really was, that was incredible. And similarly, with African-American faculty, um, I tried to do the same thing. And that is, um, I approached um, them about, um, uh, I wanted to start at the top to teach a lesson to departments. Mm -hmm. So I thought about the people at the top who should be recruited first. And so my first one was Toni Morrison. Mm. And I thought, OK, um, this is a very uh, uh, excellent writer. And okay. so I'll, you know, <laughs> well, that was a problem because Toni Morrison didn't have a PhD. Mm. Um, and she was at SUNY Albany. Mm -hmm. Princeton doesn't recruit yeah, from yeah. SUNY Albany. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a lot of what I was trying to do is to demonstrate how impoverished mm -hmm. the reasoning is for excluding people. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought she'd be a good example of that. So in any case, um, so I asked her to apply. She refused. Mm. Um, because being Toni Morrison, right. <laughs> are you kidding me? Why would I apply for anything? Don't they know who I am? Yeah. That, was, that was the way she said it. Right. Um, so I then asked the, um, uh, the, the search uh, committee, would you consider Toni Morrison? They said, well, we won't if she won't, if she won't submit her materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I did the logical thing, and I went upstairs and typed up her resume and submitted it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, it was a, there was a lot, there was a process, of course, but still the English department wouldn't budge. Um, the English department wouldn't budge because, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't a literary critic, mm. ha ha. And then, um, and then um, the writers in creative writing rebelled because they said, wait a minute, you know, we're very famous writers and we have lecturer positions. And you're going to bring in Toni Morrison as a professor and a, a chaired professor at that? So they rebelled. Right. But in one of the most extraordinary things that I ever saw, the president of Princeton um, marched over to creative writing and promised them faculty appointments just to bring Toni Morrison to Princeton. Ah, um, and so she did come, and luckily, uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize that year and then the Nobel Prize. And then it became, of course, we knew all along. Uh, right? Of course. Yeah, of, of course. course. Um, and, uh, uh, but not only that, it's very funny. When you go to Princeton today, what do you see? You see a Toni Morrison Hall, mm -hmm. right? Oh, um, it's a Toni Morrison all over. And imagine, imagine the experience that so many people have had um, as a consequence of breaking through that. And um, for example, Mackenzie Scott was her student, ah, yes. right? 
and look at the good that McKinsey Scott is doing, including giving $50 million to Prairie View. Right. Um, that's all from Tony Morrison. Yes. So, I, so I've, I've, I've sort of tried in my career to push against those conventions that keep us from honestly assessing people's work and their mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that's what I'm proudest of. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we would like to get some audience questions, and so I'm going to ask Professor Miles to come up to the stage. She's going to moderate Q&A. And while she's coming up, I want to ask you a quick question about one of your accomplishments at Brown, and that was when you established the committee that explored Brown's relationship, involvement yep. in slavery. Um, that was very risky. Another thing that you did that was risky, um, but a uh, wonderful example of your leadership. I want to quickly ask you, why did you do that? Um, well, it, see, the thing is, um, to me, it was very simple. Um, and I, I don't like people making a lot of it mm. because it was actually quite simple. Um, because of what education has done for me, I believe so much in the power of education and in the importance of universities. Mm -hmm. um, because I know what good it does for the world. And when people ask, well, what is the relationship between the transatlantic slave trade and the founding of Brown? Um, I thought that was a simple question that needed to be answered. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to tell the truth, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and again, going back to what my mother, the worst thing you could do in my family was tell a lie, mm -hmm. the worst. Um, and so uh, I thought um, for, uh, for people to respect universities, mm -hmm. we have to be true to um, the values that we promulgate. Uh, and so we talk a lot about people relying on universities for the truth, for facts. Right. And yet, if we're unwilling to do that with our own history, what must people think of us? So that was the reason. Everybody thought I was crazy at the time, but, um, but I just thought it was a basic principle that we needed to uh, follow. Hmm. Well, thank you for standing your ground. A lot of universities, including this one, owe you a debt of gratitude because they followed your example. Thank you. This dialogue between you two has been so mesmerizing that we listened right past the time. It was so wonderful to hear uh, oh. many of the hacks and, and strategies and tactics you shared, President Simmons. I think that we are going to take a little bit more time to, Good. to um, have some engagement with the audience questions. And I will remind people in the room, if you'd like to post a question, please use the Slido app. It's right there. And also, you can access it via, via Zoom. So I am going to do my best to combine some of these questions so we can get through a few of them. Uh, while going over not very long. Yeah. First, I would like you to know, Dr. Simmons, that there is so much love being expressed for you mm -hmm. in Slido in these comments. Some people are just writing in to say how much they admire you, how visionary oh. you are, uh, to say that um, their dad grew up in Houston and went to Prairie View, and they just are thrilled to hear you speak. People are saying, come to Brown and do a book signing. So there's just a, <laughs> lo a lot of that happening uh, in this app. There are also questions from people who would love to have your advice on how to navigate their careers. So we have people who are asking, how did you withstand perhaps being stereotyped as a black woman in higher education? There's somebody who writes in saying that he is a black male librarian, then there are so few black male librarians. How would you suggest that he deal with imposter syndrome in his area of work? Uh, by not being an imposter. Um, I think that that's uh, why I'm so grateful to uh, people in my childhood who 
framed this for me. Uh, and that is, every part of who you are contributes to your uniqueness and to your advantage, in a sense, as a human being. See, that's the thing. Um, and you know, I was talking to, to Larry, uh, if I may say this, Larry, um, about you know, sort of things that similar things that we um, uh, experience as, as children. And one of the things that's most important is that you find out who you are. Um, and you come to terms with that, and that you have some capacity to understand what uh, assets you bring. Uh, there was never any question in my mind that coming from the fields of East Texas, experiencing the Civil Rights Revolution, having been desperately poor, all of that, I thought, is wonderful for informing my leadership because I can understand things that I know some other people can't understand, right? So I knew that, and because I knew that, I wasn't concerned with, other peop with, with trying to borrow from other people. I didn't want to be them. I didn't want to. Now, it's true that when I was a student, uh, especially the year that I was at Wellesley, I felt, you know, pretty impoverished because uh, I was surrounded by wealthy, wealthy women, um, and um, and the question, and they were taking fancy vacations and doing all kinds of things, and it would have been possible for me to develop an affectation around that identity, uh, but. What held me back from that was the deep respect I had for the path that my um, grandparents and my parents had traveled. And I thought, what a disservice to them it would be if I trans, somehow if I traded that in, the wealth of what that is, to be um, something that I'm not. And so, uh, so I, I mean it seriously uh, when I say don't be an imposter because it usually doesn't work out well. Nobody wants to follow an imposter. Um, uh, and so what are, uh, the other thing that I discovered uh, was, um, you know, I thought that, that I would be prevented from doing certain kinds of things because I was, uh, I had strong views and which I articulated um, constantly. Um, I had strong beliefs um, and so on. And I thought, well, you know, nobody really wants that. But it turns out I was wrong about that. Um, and, and so because I began to understand that um, Smith came to me because women's education was at a point where they were concerned about whether or not women would choose uh, enrollment at places like Smith. So they were looking for something different um, and a way of thinking about what Smith could be um, for um, young people going forward. Um, and so a contrarian was what they needed. Mm -hmm. um, and if I had not been a contrarian, I probably never would have become uh, president of Smith or president of Brown for that matter. Um, because I, although I, I really suspected when Brown asked me to become president that they really didn't know who I was. Um, and so I met with them and I said, you know, I don't think you know who I am. I, I, you know, I try to describe the fact that I was a troublemaker, um, <laughs> that I was not going to be swayed by them to do what they wanted if I didn't agree with it. And I had this very serious conversation with the chairman of the board to say, I, I want you to know what you're getting into uh, <laughs> if, if you have me as president. I can only do what I think is the right thing to do. Are you willing to do that? So you do want to hew to who you are. Um, but you've got to do some work on that because you've got to know who, what that is and you've got to test those values and, uh, and make sure that, um, that they're beneficial um, in some regards. Um, but that's what I would say. 
Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions, and they're still coming in, about what it's been like to be a black woman as you have lived your life, about stereotypes, about microaggressions, how you handled those. I feel that you are showing us a living example right now <laughs> of how to do that. But would you want to speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I um, forthrightly, I mean, I, it was the only way I knew how to do it. I had a very dear mentor um, in Aaron Lemonick, the dean of the faculty at Princeton. And um, he, he was, just, I admired him so much. He was just a terrific person. Uh, but he was very, he was fierce, very scary. The faculty were scared of him. Um, uh, <laughs> But um, one, uh, I, was, I was the associate dean of the faculty, number two in the office, and we had an associate dean for research mm. who was a male. And um, uh, when Aaron left for the summer, he was a physicist, and he, he would go to Three Mile Island to do some research. And when he was away, I ran the dean of the faculty office, and so that meant that I saw everything. And one day, I happened to open the mail um, and discovered that it was a list of salaries. Uh, and of course, it was too late for me to ignore it because my, my eyes fell on my salary and then on my colleague's salary. Um, and my colleague was, um, had no uh, PhD um, and certainly was not as good as I was. Um, <laughs> No, honestly, it wasn't. Um, uh, and I was the senior uh, uh, person, um, and yet he was making $10,000 more than I. And I thought about that. I was shattered. I thought, oh my god. Um, I didn't know if it was because I was black that I was getting paid less, or because it was, I was a woman, or maybe both. But then I had to figure out what to do about it. And then I just went, you know, completely to my heart and decided to talk to him. So when he came back, I made an appointment to meet with him, and I said, "I want you to know that I was opening the mail, and um, uh, it happened to be salaries, and I discovered that you're paying um, this person ten thousand dollars more than me. Um, I'm going to tell you something." And I don't want to talk about it, but I want you to know what I have to say. And what I said simply was, I know you know that this is entirely unjust because I'm far more qualified uh, than he, and yet you're paying him more money. And I want you to know that because of this, I will never feel the same way about working for you again. Wow. And then I left. Um, he needed to know that it wasn't just about the salaries. It mm -hmm. was about the confidence that I had in him mm -hmm. and the respect that I had for him as a fair person. And that was shattered. Um, within a day, they, they increased my salary to... <laughs> to but but that, was, you know, that wasn't the point, really. Uh, um, and so... Um, he was, without question, the most important man to me in, my, um, in, my, in that part of my career. And he is responsible for my becoming a college president, this man who did that to me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I had to do was to learn to forgive him for that um, and to think about um, how I could use that to help with um, faculty salaries, and so on. And so we instituted a process of reviewing faculty, women's faculty salaries, and I was given responsibility for doing that. So there were good things that came out of it as a consequence. But still, um, there's no substitute for standing up for yourself, because I, I think it's generally true that if you allow people to roll over you, uh, you probably deserve to be walked on, you know? Um, well, that's a little harsh, okay. I, <laughs> but but I, think, I think the point is that, um, that standing up for yourself is the beginning of people beginning to acknowledge you as an equal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so.
thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking at uh, my dean over here to see if I can ask a couple more questions. Okay, one okay. more. Okay. One more. Okay. okay, one more question. This is a combined question for many people. They would like to know your view of higher education today. In particular, what are the biggest challenges the higher education faces? What do you say to students who think, well, I don't need a college degree now, I don't have you know, faith in institutions? And how has COVID affected higher education? So any wow. one of those that you might like to address? <laughs> Small question. <laughs> that was one. <laughs> uh, from what I can see, uh, and I range pretty widely. I'm, I'm president of, I mean, I'm chairman of the Federal Reserve Board at Houston. Um, I work with the um, uh, corporate uh, groups all the time. Uh, I work with community groups. From what I can see, the best value today is education, without question. I, I have no hesitation um, in saying that at all. But I'm not one who believes that everybody needs to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And what my career has tried to demonstrate is that you can go to a small college like Dillard and then go to Harvard, and then you can work at a college like Spelman and then work at Princeton, and you can be president of a Prairie View and be president of an Ivy League university. So I'm trying to blur those lines enough for people to understand that, um, that they don't have to look for the costliest option mm. to be educated. Um, and I work with community colleges uh, all the time um, and believe that that's a very good option for people. Um, and so I, I just think um, that um, the be I would always advise uh, young people learn as much as you can in whatever setting you can learn it. Because you're, what you put into your mind is going to give you the best returns in the long, in the long run, for sure. In terms of education, the challenge of education, I mean, we, we are mired uh, in all kinds of disputes um, right now. And um, there are two ways to look at that. One is to do what some misguided individuals do and to say, um, okay, that just shows how bankrupt um, universities are because they ought to toe the line and they ought to make sure everybody is doing things a certain way. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is there is no place left that I know of in this country where you can have a conversation about anything controversial without, uh, did you see the story, by the way, uh, today of the congressman who um, challenges the head of the union and, they, and he wants to have a fight on the, on the floor? Mm. Uh, of, I mean, this is where we are. And so uh, we have an opportunity in universities still um, to make it possible for us to model how to get along in a diverse um, society in which we are, of course, going to have different views. Um, we're, of course, going to be um, uh, 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 unable to reconcile those views in the final analysis. But the process that we undergo in working through those things is so vital to who we are as a democracy. And so to me, that's the most valuable role um, of the university today, is that societal role. If we can lead in that space and lead with vision and integrity, uh, whatever happens today, uh, tomorrow is going to be stronger for us because we have held to our values and promoted the best that we can do as human beings in reaching across difference um, and in solving problems together. Oh, thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I have just a few words uh, in closing. I'd like to thank President Simmons for that incredibly inspiring, inspiring. rich, yes. thought-provoking conversation with Dean Brown Nagin. I don't think any of us will ever forget the words that you shared today. I'd also like to thank our audience for the wonderful questions. And I promise you, I will share the ones I didn't get to with Dr. Simmons after the event. So at least she knows what you were thinking. This session has been recorded. And you can find it on the Radcliffe Institute website. And Did I get also... permission for that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, there's a nod. I guess there's I did. Evidently, she said oh, okay. you did. I yeah. did, okay. It's not over there. <laughs> See, this is the example, you all, right? This is the example. That was you know, you, flex, you forget, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, so please visit radcliffe.harvard.edu for this recording, I hope, and for the recordings of previous events. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our conversation partners. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>